As I discussed with Cardinal Burke, the correspondence published on Tuesday by Monsignor Anthony Figueredo, former personal secretary to the former disgraced Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, confirms that Pope Benedict imposed some sort of restrictions on McCarrick and that Cardinal World may have known of those restrictions, in spite of claims to the contrary. The correspondence also proves that McCarrick ignored those restrictions. Here with more analysis is theologian, columnist, and author of The Fragility of Order and the forthcoming The Irony of Modern Catholic History. Welcome, George Weigel, back to the program. Thank you, Raymond. Great to see you. Uh, I want to start with this August 25th, 2008 letter from McCarrick to the then papal nuncio, Archbishop Pietro Sambi, that reveals that McCarrick's acknowledgement of the restrictions imposed on him. He wrote, having studied the letter of Cardinal Ray, the then head of the Congregation for Bishops, and having shared it with my Archbishop, Whirl, I pledge again that I shall always try to be a good servant of the Church even if I do not understand its desires in my life. Of course, I'm ready to accept the Holy Father's will in my regard. I could find a place to live at one of the parishes in the Archdiocese of Washington. The Archbishop is willing to arrange for that in any area that the Holy See would desire. In summary, in the future, I will make no commitments to accept any public appearances or talks without the express permission of the Apostolic Nuncio or the Holy See itself. Seems as if there's evidence in Rome or in the nuncio files in D.C., George, that restrictions were in place. Does this vindicate Vigano, who made these charges that world's known all along? It certainly vindicates uh, Archbishop Vigano's claim that uh, Benedict XVI, uh, presumably having been informed of uh, some very bad problems with then Cardinal McCarrick, essentially told him to shut down. Mm. Let's also remember that it was Benedict XVI who rather quickly after his election uh, accepted the pro forma resignation that Cardinal McCarrick had, had submitted, right. but manifestly did not expect to be accepted for, for at least several years. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have here, I'm afraid, is, is a, discipline, a lack of disciplinary follow-up. Yeah. That letter you just quoted, uh, for those of us who knew Cardinal McCarrick for many years, <laughs> Uh, he's treading water. He, he's playing for time. He's mm -hmm. waiting till things calm down. And then he's going to proceed uh, to get right back to, to what he had been doing, mm -hmm. uh, which was inserting himself uh, into a whole lot of things that were really not his, his business. Mm -hmm. uh, and in his newly retired state, you know, setting himself up as a kind of parallel foreign minister uh, of the Vatican. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that may have been at the request of the Holy See. I suspect that most of it was self-initiated. Uh -huh. And then trying by, to ingratiate uh, himself with Caroline and, 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 the, and, and, and then the, uh, the superiors simply shrug and, and, and go along uh, with it. Mm. Um, I, I said in the Catholic World Report piece I published mm -hmm. yesterday about my little cameo role in mm -hmm. this. Oh, yes, which we're going to get to. And Don't ruin it, George. <laughs> <laughs> and other aspects of this that um, what this reveals, uh, I think, publicly is what many of us had known for a long time. Mm -hmm. This man was a relentless self-promoter. Yeah. He was an extraordinary sycophant with superiors he thought uh, could uh, help him. And the wealthy. And he uh, was quite shameless about pushing himself into matters uh, that were of some interest to him, whether that was mm -hmm. China or uh, the church in Islam right. or, or whatever. Uh, now, when we roll the videotape back mm -hmm. a few years, I would like to know if there is going to be any release of the full letter that Cardinal Ratzinger sent to the bishops of the United States at their mm -hmm. June 2004 meeting on the matter of uh, Catholic, of poli communion. Catholic politicians who were off the reservation badly on the abortion issue presenting themselves for Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. uh, McCarrick redacted that letter and read only parts of it to the bishop at the June meeting. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be very instructive to see the whole letter. Mm. Well, there's an interesting tie-in. I'm going to ask this question, but don't forget that because there's a there's a link here. Uh, an October 7, 2008 email from McCarrick to Figueredo 
further clarifies the restrictions he was operating under. He writes, Cardinal Ray has approved my moving to a parish, and my Archbishop, Whirl, has been great in beginning to work that out. I've agreed to make no public appearances, either here or abroad, without the permission and resign from all Roman and USCCB entities. Cardinal Ray has also forbidden me to come to Rome. Now, the note also indicates that the original letter is going from the nuncio to Ray in the pouch, the diplomatic pouch. Two days later, in an email to Figueredo, McCarrick writes, I have sent the copy directly to Archbishop World. Now, this seems to prove that Cardinal World had some knowledge, complete knowledge, of these restrictions and the penalties. My question is, what impact will this have on World's credibility, firstly? Uh, I, I, I think this is very sad, actually. Uh, in many respects, uh, Cardinal Worrell was a very fine Archbishop of Washington, mm -hmm. uh, and he deserves uh, credit for uh, being that. Uh, I cannot understand why he has taken uh, the position he has on, mm -hmm. on the McCarrick business uh, since it first broke uh, a year ago. Uh, and it does now seem quite uh, clear that he, he was aware, whether he now recalls that or not, right that he was aware of uh, what was what was going on. But at a certain point, Raymond, the buck has to stop at the Holy See. Mm -hmm. If it was the Holy See that was saying, we want you to stay at home, right. pray, be a good emeritus bishop, and, and just get out of the limelight. limelight. Mm -hmm. It's up to the Holy See to, to enforce that, and that means it's up to the nuncio to enforce mm. that. It's up to the Cardinal Secretary of State, of course, Tarsicio Bertone at that time. Mm. Uh, there was a real failure of follow-through mm -hmm. on this by people who should have understood that if you didn't put something equivalent to right. an electronic lock on right. this man's leg. It was going to lead to more problems he, he was for the church. To go and keep doing his thing. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this also speaks to, and you mentioned that letter, that infamous letter that then Pope Benedict writes about the, the uh, reception of communion for politicians who are departing from church teaching on life. At the time, McCarrick indeed had custody of that letter. The president of the bishop's conference at that time was the new Archbishop of Washington, Wilton Gregory. What pressure is there now on Gregory, given that he's pr promised to be transparent, to become forthcoming with the letters and documents that might be in the Washington archives now? Uh, I don't know what's in the Washington archives. Mm -hmm. uh, Archbishop Gregory is a very competent mm -hmm. uh, man who I think uh, did the church uh, a very good service during mm -hmm. the first abuse crisis in 2002. Uh, he knows that he's got a big problem of trust here in the Archdiocese of Washington. Uh, but as we go forward on this, you know, rather important question yeah. of is the reception of Holy Communion by people who are involved in what is now not just bordering on infanticide, mm -hmm. but in the case of, of several recently passed state laws, is infanticide. Uh, that it would be very good to know what Cardinal Ratzinger had written in 2004 on that. Yeah. Uh, I want to move on to a letter from September 1st, 2008. Now, this is McCarrick writing to Tarsicio Bertone, the uh, Vatican Secretary of State, and he offers him an account of his behaviors in light of the restrictions that Ray wrote him about. He says this, I do recognize that in one particular case I had been at fault, in an unfortunate lack of judgment. I've always considered my priests and seminarians as part of my family, and just as I've shared a bed with my cousins and uncles and other relatives without thinking of it being wrong, I had done this on occasion when the diocesan summer house was overcrowded. In, any, in no case were there minors involved, but men in their 20s and 30s. And he goes on, I'm not going to, you know, but he goes on to deny any wrongdoing. He said he never had sexual relations with anybody. Um, it, now, we now know for certain that this is not true. He abused adults, he abused minors. Doesn't this prove that the Vatican also knew he was at least sharing beds with seminarians and everybody just looked the other way? Yeah, it's, it's a very disturbing letter, both in, in his either manifest incomprehension... Oh, my gosh. I don't know about you, but I haven't he shared was, beds with what, cousins no, or uncles. I, 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 certainly, that's not part of my family life. Um, 
Uh, and yeah, I mean, look, if you are Cardinal Bertone and you get that letter, uh, you are on the phone to the nuncio in the next hour and saying, we want these sanctions enforced. Mm -hmm. This is a bomb waiting to go off. We don't know that this man is not engaging in, in untoward behavior now, and we want him uh, under, under some form of control. Look, if he had been remanded to a religious house, mm -hmm. uh, as he was uh, after he lost Eventually, the, red, yeah. the red hat, uh, a lot of, of a lot of trouble would have been saved. Mm -hmm. uh, now, but but why confess to a lack of judgment, of the sharing the bed and all of this to Bertone? It, it, it is bizarre. It, it's spin. It's uh -huh. spin. buying for t as you said earlier, buying time. No, I mean, look, uh, the here's the reality of of the beach house, mm -hmm. the diocesan beach house, yeah. as he's describing it. Rumors about all of that had been going around for years, mm. but no one had ever come forward and said, mm. this happened to me on such and such right. a date in this place, and I am willing to stake my reputation on that. Right. So at least in those days, if no one was willing to come forward and, and lay a, a serious accusation and put their own reputation on the line, uh, you, you know, you just hoped it was mm -hmm. a bunch of stories. Yeah. But there were so many of them. Oh, there were tons of them. That yep. it, it, it now uh, seems very clear, as it was from the settlements that were reached in, in Newark and Metuchen, mm -hmm. uh, that, there, that there were real problems here that, that frankly went unaddressed. Mm -hmm. Whatever happened in 2007 or in 2008, it's clear from this new correspondence dump that by 2013, McCarrick was up and running again. He writes about uh, traveling a good deal, uh, that in the next week he's going to be in Cyprus and the Balkans and the Middle East, Lebanon, the Holy Land. And then he says he's put off his return to China. He'll make sure he'll, he speaks with Archbishop uh, Paroline before the next time. Uh, uh, my question is, you have him coordinating and really a part of this negotiation with China on some level. Does that disturb you, given the uh, deal that look, was finally no, come to? Knowing uh, Cardinal McCarrick, uh, the former Cardinal McCarrick, as I do, it is entirely possible that he was doing all of this on his own wicket. Mm. It'd be nice to know who paid for all of this right. travel. Exactly. That would be an interesting point. Um, and that he was simply attempting to play along with the superiors in Rome and try to say, look, I'm, I'm really conducting a parallel channel for you guys here. Right. This is all helpful and whatnot. Now, the question is, why didn't they say to him, then Archbishop Paroline later, Cardinal Paroline, stop it. We don't want you doing this. Right. Now, the deal, as I have written and we have, I believe, mm -hmm. discussed here, is a terrible deal Horrible. that never should have been made, is looking even worse as six to eight on. months uh, out, mm -hmm. as China continues its uh, brutal persecution of, of, of religious groups. Um, whether McCarrick had anything to do with defining that, I frankly doubt, in the sense that this was the deal mm -hmm. that John Paul II could have had. Mm -hmm. It's the deal that Benedict XVI could have had, and they, and both, they both said, no, we're not going to let the state or now the Chinese Communist Government, Party right. uh, nominate bishops. So, mm. you know, McCarrick's claim to be in the loop on this stuff may should, or may be, not be true. should be taken with the same large um, salt shaker, <laughs> not grain of salt, as his claim in, the, in that infamous Villanova lecture mm -hmm. to have kind of wired the conclave, the conclave. Of, of 2013, mm -hmm. uh, during which one of his brother cardinals told me, we're duct taping his mouth. <laughs> He was getting so out of control within the discussions uh -huh. of, of the American cardinals that we should, the cardinal in question said to me, we're going to have to duct tape it. Mm, wow. Uh, now, there's a moment here in this new document dump where a certain George Weigel appears. Right. Your big moment. Uh, I want to read this. In January 27th of 2017, in a letter to Pope Francis, 
McCarrick mentions rumors that the Trump administration might be considering naming George Weigel to the role of ambassador to the Holy See. The letter reads, there were rumors here in Washington that the new U.S. government had submitted a request for an agreement for a new U.S. ambassador to the Holy See. One of the names that was mentioned was that of George Weigel. He is very much a leader of the ultra-conservative wing of the Catholic Church in the United States and has been publicly critical of your holiness in the past. Men Many of us American bishops would have great concerns about his being named to such a position in which he would have an official voice in opposition to your teaching. I would be happy to discuss this with you and also with the high officials of the Curia. Your reaction to this? Well, it's all it's all rubbish uh, and, and nonsense. Uh, first of all, on January 17th, I think was the date of that letter, the Trump administration had not even been inaugurated. Right. So the notion that they had reached out to the Holy See for an agreement on a new ambassador is is absurd on the face of it. Secondly, uh, where I think so you were not offered the post. I wasn't interested in it uh -huh. and wouldn't have accepted it if if it had been offered because I have other things to do. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I think where McCarrick picked this up or one of his minions picked it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, was in a squib in Vatican Insider ah. by the British journalist Christopher Lamb uh, on January 13th, uh -huh. in which he went through a number of plausible candidates and then threw in at the end wild cards <laughs> who included Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> Bill O'Reilly, and me. George Weigel. <laughs> so I, I know Chris Lamb, so I sent him an email and I said, look, I could have saved you a lot of trouble if you'd asked me about this. I'm not interested. I wouldn't have accepted it. He wrote back sort of apologizing for doing this mm -hmm. without, without um, uh, asking uh, whether there was anything uh, to it. Mm -hmm. So, look, if... McCarrick was so out of it that he imagined that I, who, as you remember, had been quite critical of, mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump. of the Trump candidacy, uh, was a candidate, that says he was really losing it. But I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. I think he took this squib in Vatican Insider as a way to backstab me uh, with the Pope. He was probably unhappy that I had had two private audiences with the Holy Father at that mm -hmm. point. Uh, so he decided to put the knife in. Mm -hmm. um, s moreover, it is simply a lie that I had been publicly critical of the Pope. Yes. I had written things questioning this, that, or the other aspect of the pontificate, including the China deal. Right. But I had always done this in a way respectful of, of the Pope himself. Mm -hmm. That was simply malicious backstabbing. Mm. Um, it's, it's not unexpected. No. Uh, it, we it, had it, not been on the same page mm -hmm. uh, for, for a long 20, time. 20 years. Yeah. But um, it, it's really almost pathetic mm -hmm. that, that this man would, would descend to this kind of calumny, mm -hmm. this kind of lying, mm -hmm. um, in order to do in someone who had been a member of his archdiocese for six years mm -hmm. and with whom he had always pretended in public to be very, very jolly and friendly mm -hmm. and avuncular and, um, and whatnot. So it's all a lot of nonsense. Yeah, well, there's a lot of that in the church. Really. <laughs> you get the smiles in the back clapping and then yeah, well, you leave the room and hopefully the scene that, changes. That is changing over, over I hope. time. But this was... This was particularly uh, unfortunate, uh, and I, you know, I frankly, the first thing I did when I saw it was laugh out loud. <laughs> Fortunately, I had saved all the correspondence with Chris Lamb. Oh, so, so you, you have the backup, and, corroborating evidence. Yeah. Now, Monsignor Figueredo, who was then McCarrick's secretary for a limited period of time, and then <clears> kind of an adjunct aide in Rome for him, uh, he claims he came forward and dumped these documents stemming from the Pope's new sex abuse guidelines, which says, if you know something, say something. Everybody has an obligation to report. D does that wash with you? I have known Monsignor Figueredo for probably 20 years. I, I like to think we're friends. I hope he thinks of me as one. Um, I had uh, no knowledge that he was, before this dump, mm -hmm. saving these... Uh, saving these materials. I did hear a month before the dump that this was likely. Mm. And I invited the person who told me to 
invite him to call me to talk about whether this was a good idea mm. uh, if if he wanted to which which he did not so mm -hmm. uh, I can't speculate on, yeah. on his motives uh, um, I, I do think he is genuinely upset at the kind of stonewalling mm. that's going mm. on about this uh, which does not serve the interests of the church, does not serve the credibility of the hierarchy, does not serve the credibility of the Holy See. Well, as I mentioned to Cardinal Burke, there is a commitment. The Vatican came out and said, we're going through all the documentation. <coughs> what kind of pressure, vis-a-vis -vis the McCarrick situation, does the Vigano revelations, as well as now the Figueredo report, place on the Vatican and U.S. church officials? Well, the Vatican is very good at playing a long game, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't uh, want to speculate on that. I don't know, Raymond, that there is a lot of revelatory paper to be uncovered here. Mm -hmm. uh, McCarrick's rise to Newark, his translation to Washington, uh, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of paper on that. Mm -hmm. uh, that was undoubtedly done backstage and whatnot. Mm. I do think it's interesting that he had left this paper trail. Right. Uh, all over the place. Essentially implicating himself in all sorts of strange and wonderful right. things. So there may be a lot more of that. And in fact, I think if you read Monsignor Figueroa's statement, mm -hmm. he says there, there's there is more, more and we'll see whether mm -hmm. it comes out. But I'm, I'm not persuaded that there is some uh, thick file of stuff related to Newark and Washington. Uh -huh. Now, what there is, is what Archbishop Vigano says he informed Pope Francis. Oh, yeah, the whole, the and file it, in the congregation right. of the bishops. And, and that, that has yet to be... And I don't know that that doesn't include material of a, of a quasi-confessional sort. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But th th that is certainly there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to pick up on that sure. point. Uh, uh, Vigano's contention that he told the Pope in June of 2013 about this. Uh, in, in his first direct comments about the McCarrick case, Pope Francis in an interview told an, a Mexican journalist this. I knew nothing, obviously nothing, nothing. I said it many times. I knew nothing. I had no idea about McCarrick. When he says that, he, he spoke to me the day... June 23rd, 2013, that he came. I don't remember if he told me about this. Whether it's true or not, no idea. But you know that I didn't know anything about McCarrick. Otherwise, I wouldn't have kept quiet, right? Your reaction. Uh, I think there's an obligation in justice to try to construe the Pope's rather rambling remarks in, mm -hmm. in the most positive light. Mm -hmm. And that is that he didn't take... Archbishop Vigano's strong suggestion mm -hmm. that he call Cardinal Ouellette, the prefect of the Congregation for Bishops, and said, let me have the file right. on, on Cardinal McCarrick. I mean, that's the best construction mm -hmm. you can put on this. As we discussed at the time of the first uh, Vigano testimony, uh, which is not without some problems, but on this key point, mm -hmm. uh, Archbishop Vigano has told me that same account three different times. Mm -hmm. Once shortly after it happened, twice mm -hmm. some years after that. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot believe that he is fabricating this that. Up. And more to the point, and I want to underscore this as I did in my Catholic yep. Report article yesterday, which perhaps you can post on your, yes, your we'll, website. We'll, we'll, we'll put it up on um, Twitter and Facebook. The notion that Archbishop Vigano's testimonies, because there are now mm -hmm. yeah, multiples, these, yeah. are, have been concocted by wealthy Americans who dislike the Pope because of his view of markets and immigration, yeah. is absolute rubbish and poppycock. Mm. That is not true, and yet it is widely believed in, in circles around Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. I have no idea whether the Pope believes it or not. Mm -hmm. And it is being sold to other leaders of the world church. I ran into this during the Synod of 2018, last October. I ran into it during the Abuse Summit mm -hmm. in February. This is a lot. And it's being used 
both to undercut mm -hmm. the church in the United States and, as I said in the article yesterday, it's being used to frame the debate prior to the next conclave. Mm -hmm. And this must stop. Mm. And it needs to be confronted. And frankly, the American bishops have to be more vocal. need to yeah. push back on this mm -hmm. yeah. because yeah. they know it's a lot. Yeah, no. There's, I mean, these you read these <coughs> conspiracy theories in, in some of these magazines from Rome, and your head explodes. You know, one wonders where was this organization? If such an organization exists, where is it? I, it doesn't seem to be very effective if it's in place. Well, Raymond, this is the kind of rubbish that people who know they're losing an argument. Mm -hmm engage in. Resort to. Mm -hmm. When you cannot meet the arguments of the legitimate critics mm -hmm. of some of the, of some aspects of this pontificate, and there are illegitimate critics, let's right. stipulate that. Some right. people have gone completely bonkers. Cuckoo, yeah. But if you cannot meet the legitimate queries, mm -hmm. much less criticisms, what do you do? Yeah. You resort to this kind of conspiracy mongering, yeah. and it is absolutely unbecoming to anyone who thinks of themselves as a church. Mm. Uh, I, I want to move on to this new draft. Uh, it's a new constitution right. for the Curia. No one's watched the Vatican closer than you, George, over many decades. Your thoughts on where this will take us? Some say, look, we're opening the windows, laity is being more involved. Your take. What does it really uh, I've do? read the draft uh, apostolic constitution. I have no idea whether it's going to be issued on June 29th, yeah. which is the rumor yeah. of the day. Uh, it is absolute nightmare. Really? Uh, it's self-referentially inconsistent throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, the first part of it has nothing to do with much of anything except mm -hmm. a lot of verbiage. Uh, there is a very serious undercutting, I believe, of, the, of what we now know as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, right. which is told that when it's in, in uh, when there's a contentious matter with other dicasteries, mm -hmm. uh, these will be settled by dialogue. No. Mm. I mean, unless CDF is the bottom line on doctrine, there is no bottom line right. on doctrine. Mm. And I, at least as I read it, I would leave canonists and others who are more familiar with that stuff to make the final judgment. But as I read it, this really guts the, the Secretariat for the Economy mm -hmm. and, and pretty well dismantles the a lot CDF. of what of what Cardinal Pell mm. uh, had put in uh, place mm. uh, in, in his uh, yeah. year, years in Rome. It's really a terrible piece of work. It's very, very shoddy. Mm. As Cardinal Mueller has said, it's theologically illiterate. Mm. So I hope there is enough pushback from the world episcopate that they take a deep breath over there mm -hmm. and say, all right, we've got to try this. Because again. this new evangelical, this evangelism uh, dicastery would sort of loom large over everything and diminish w the, the role of the congregation. Well, it's, the it's, it's very unclear what this dicastery for evangelization is supposed to do. Right. Um, the fact that it's listed first, I don't know what that means. I think there's probably a bit of hysteria about that. But if you actually read the documents, very unclear what it is. Mm -hmm. The thing on CDF, what we now know as CDF, is unbelievable. It, it's as yeah. if this congregation were the Catholic Theological Society of America or an academic <laughs> seminar uh -huh. instead of the bottom line of the integrity of, of Catholic faith and belief. So it's a big mess. It's essentially not fixable. Uh, I have sent friendly bishops a list of what I consider absolute bottom line things that cannot stay in this mm. if the intention is to push it through. But my frank hope is that it's back to the drawing boards yeah. because this is, this is, this is a real Edsel here. Yeah, no, it's a nightmare. I mean, it's, it's an Edsel yeah. and it isn't going to You mentioned Cardinal George Pell yeah. who was convicted in March of um, sexual abuse against two minors, um, really on the word of just one person with no corroborating evidence right. beyond that according to reports and those who were in the room and, and watched the trial closely. Uh, he is appealing this right. next week. Give me your thoughts on where we are here and what reasonable he can expect. What is reasonable? Well, uh, the appeal will be heard by a three-judge panel on, on June 5th and 6th, and then they will go make up their minds. 
whether this verdict was what is called in Australia an unsafe verdict, which means the jury could not have rationally mm, come, to, come this to this conclusion. conclusion. That is absolutely the case. Mm. So as I have been saying in my own writing and, and media commentary on this, what's really on trial right now is the Australian justice system. Mm. If this verdict is not quashed, when it is manifestly a false and wicked verdict, then people are going to really have to wonder, is it safe to travel to Australia? Mm. Is it safe to do business in Australia? Mm. Is there any rule of law in Australia? Yeah. So we'll see. Um, I think the case for quashing the verdict and exonerating the cardinal is so overwhelming that I cannot see how three senior jurists, mm. presumably men of probity and experience, Mm -hmm. can possibly do anything else but quash this. Mm. However, the public atmosphere remains completely toxic. Right. So we'll see. And you've got major media figures who've written books about this and are writing books and they're doing documentaries. Paid I for mean, by the Australian government. The fact that the, one of the chief persecutors of Cardinal Pell, Louise Milligan, mm -hmm. works for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation is scandalous. Mm. This is absolutely scandalous. Her book was totally shredded yeah. by Julia Yost at mm -hmm. First Things a couple of mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, but this is absolutely scandalous uh, that she is being, she's on the government payroll, this mm -hmm. is the government TV, yeah. and continuing to do this. Mm -hmm. What is going on here? Well, and then there's the, there was a report that Pell would not, if he loses this appeal, he would not ask for an abbreviated sentence. Edward Penton is reporting today, talking to those close to Pell, that his, he and his lawyers have made no determination no, about no. this. I, I, I am in regular touch with all of the principles in this, and mm -hmm. that's not true. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll leave it there. George Weigel, thank, thank you for being here. The book, The Fragility of Order, Catholic Reflections on Turbulent Times, and the most recent is the most recent work by George Weigel, and his forthcoming book, The Irony of Modern Catholic History, is forthcoming in September. September 7th. So you can get that in the days ahead. George, thank you for being here. Thank you.